many facets of of being here i've got up here and come nigh to shout and getting excited we've got something to be excited about then last week the message always excites me and i'm always nervous you know, whenever you get up and do something for the Lord, the time that you are not nervous is the time you need to sit down. Because if there is not some uh, awe, I guess that's the word I'm looking for, to be in awe of what you're singing about, I mean, you think of the price that He paid to make it way that you sung about. And... Think about the way that he made to allow us to be here. Now, I know this building is not the church that we as individuals, born again believers, we're the church. Amen. But I thank God that he's given you all and us today such a beautiful, beautiful building. And I thank God and I could come in. I come in and, and, and I see how well it's taken care of. And that blesses my heart because there are some churches that you go in that they're not taken care of. And the people that, and people think these are menial things, but I tell you, God's taken notice. People that come to clean, people that come to do various things, and God's going to honor that. God, God's going to honor that. But the message that, that God has placed on my heart today, last week we, we, we talked about, um, is there a cause? And we understand that there, the world in the shape it's in, we see it unfolding every day. Um, the division that is in our country, and we can go back and we can, we can try to blame it, but I tell you, as much as I would like to blame current administration or previous administrations for the shape this country is in it's not a political issue the issue is not a uh, one that can be settled by politics the issue in the country in which you and I live and really all around the world is a sin issue and we have gotten used to the dark to the point that we think, well, that's not that bad. Or this over here, this is not that bad. Um, we watch things that we normally maybe used to wouldn't watch. And we think, well, this isn't X-rated, but it's R-rated that leaves nothing to the imagination. We watch movies, Christians. I've done it. We face battles every day. If you research, do a word study on the word battle, battles, battled, fight, or any type of term like that that speaks of what you and I go through every day, you will find those words used over 300 times in the scripture. And I think that bears paying attention to. I've tried to be God's instrument. God to use me to stir us up. Stir me up first. Because if a preacher stands and preaches. And the message doesn't affect him and convict him. Before he delivers it. Or is God's method to deliver it to his people. Then something's wrong. Um, and I will not, I give you my word for as long as y'all have me here preaching, that I'll not deliver as God is my witness and by His grace and strength because in me I'm nothing. Like I've said before, you meet me and forget me, you've lost nothing. You meet Him and forget Him, you've lost everything. The Bible says in Mark chapter 8, that what shall a man profit if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? But we are in a day-to-day -day battle. We as individuals, 
we as a collective body of believers, we as a nation, we as a world, are facing battles every day. There are three, three main enemies that we face. And you say, but our, our advers the adversary, and we always refer to him, um, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse number 8, be sober, be vigilant for your adversary, the devil. It's, there's no doubt that he has got and influenced people in so many different ways. But there is the world is our is an is enemy that we face. The institutions of the world. Not physical flesh and blood. Ephesians chapter 6 tells us we wrestle not against flesh and blood. But against powers, principalities, spiritual wickedness in high places. We see this everywhere. There's an overwhelming philosophy in this world that what this country was founded on is no longer needed. That we no longer need to depend on the church or the word of God. Let me remind this nation, let me remind anybody that would ever hear this. All of us can go back to a time in our life when we were tossed on the seas of this life. The storm raging. And one day, thank God, we saw a light. That lighthouse that stands up there on Calvary's hill that shines that light so we all could see so that we don't dash our, our vessel against the rock so that we do not fall by the wayside. And the day that we get to where we think we don't need it, that we don't need that lighthouse, that we can say that we do not need to, I mean, the old songwriter wrote, I can't even walk without him holding my hand. Colbert and, his, and Sister Croft sat down and wrote the song in a moment of despair in their life. She sat down and began to play on the piano. He sat down with the, on the scribble on a, um, a used up piece of paper and he wrote the words, I can't even walk without him holding my hand. How that... I thought number one would surely be me. I thought I could do a lot on my own. And the sooner we realize and empty ourselves of ourselves, then we'll realize that the battles that you and I face sometimes are very unnecessary. And sometimes, <coughs> sometimes they're of our own making. You know, I, my, my stepdad, before he passed away this past March, um, was raised in the Mormon church and one of their tenets in the Mormon church was there must needs, always must needs be opposition. And when we would face battles at home, he would come to me and say, Jeff, there must needs be opposition. I said, look, and I think y'all testify to this, you don't need to force battles or opposition. It's going to come. As long as we live and breathe on the face of this earth with the influence of the world, the flesh, and the devil, we find that we're going to face opposition every day. And it's going to come. Our bodies will oppose us. The, spirit, um, the evil spirits in this world will oppose us. And sometimes Satan himself will. But here in Ezekiel chapter number 14, begin reading in verse number 12. The Bible says, the word of the Lord came, un, came again to me saying, Son of man, when the land sinneth against me by trespassing grievously, then I will stretch out my hand upon it, and I will break the staff of the bread thereof, and will send famine upon it, and will cut off man and beast from it. Though these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in it, they should deliver but their own souls by their righteousness, saith the Lord God. If I cause some noisome beast to pass through the land and they spoil it so that they be desolate, let no man pass through because of the beasts. Though these three men were in it, as I live, saith the Lord God, they shall deliver neither sons nor daughters, nor only they only shall be delivered, but the land shall be desolate. Or if I bring sword upon the land, sword go through the land so that I cut off man and beast from it. 
Though these three were in. Thank you, sweetheart. Thank you so much. Though these three men were in it, as I live, saith the Lord God, they shall deliver neither sons nor daughters, but they only shall be delivered themselves. Or I send a pestilence into the land and pour out my fury upon it in blood to cut off from it man and beast. Though Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, as I live, saith the Lord God, they shall neither deliver their son nor daughter, but they shall deliver their own souls by their righteousness. Lord, we ask your hand be upon us today. Speak out of us exactly what you would have us to say. Nothing more, nothing less. That we as a church body this morning, we as a assembled together body of believers here this morning, Lord, if there's one in our midst that doesn't know you as our personal Lord and Savior, Lord, let this be the day. That they make that sure before they leave here today. And Father we ask you Lord to help us to see exactly what you want us to see in this message this morning. For Lord I sit with these wonderful people and wait to hear from heaven this morning. I ask these things in Jesus name. Amen. If you'll notice a reoccurring statement in this, in this passage that I read. You notice that he speaks of Noah, Daniel, and Job. Three of the most godly men ever mentioned in the Bible. Said even though these men were in the Bible, they can't do anything but for themselves. If I send a pestilence, I send famine, I send the sword, I send all these things to this op opposition that we come that come against us. Then I say, well, surely the influence of these men, and they may persuade others. But though you or I are in this world and do our best to serve God, that broad way that leads to destruction is still going to be heavily populated. There's so many people that though you and I do our best and we can live as holy as, as human beings are able to, but Ezekiel is saying here, the Lord told Ezekiel, said, look, you, these people have had Noah, Daniel, and Job. Noah stood for 120 years and preached and told them judgment's coming. Because only the thoughts and intents of their heart were only evil continually. We see that in our nation. The Bible, Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be when the sun come in the Son of Man. You can't see much more evil than we're seeing today. People attacking people on the streets. And what do they do? They send them to jail. They go to court. They release them back out on the street for them to do it again. And they said that we are against reforming people. And that we need to be more understanding about these people that may murder somebody's son or daughter but in the same notion they'll kill innocent babies before they've even had a chance to make a difference in this world that being said no matter how godly how many godly people that we have in this world it still boils down to our individual relationship with God that will make a difference Noah's he said he couldn't save his sons or daughters. His sons or daughters had to have their own relationship with God. A preacher could stand up here and preach with the power of God on them so strong that the paint peels off the walls. But it still will boil down to our individual relationship with God that makes a difference. That's a message that God is trying to tell Ezekiel. He's dealing with Israel as a nation during this time. He's telling them this is what's going to happen to you. Despite these godly men being on you. This is what's going to happen to you. And these godly men preached and preached and preached. And stood and stood and stood. <coughs> and some were converted. Many were not. Many did not. have. They marveled at what God did through these men. But they did not. A great number did not influence. And I know that seems like a bleak picture. 
But the thing you and I have to remember is when we face these battles that we don't give up even if the whole world goes against us. We are not to back down from the battle. As we face these three enemies. The world, the flesh, and the devil. Fix that so that don't happen no more. Do not disturb. Okay. <laughs> Apologize for that. But the world, the flesh, and the devil. And we're going to look at that through the lives of these three men. The battles that they faced. How they overcame. And how you and I could learn as we face the same battles they did. How we can overcome. First one he mentioned is Noah. We know the story of Noah. We know the account that Noah had. We know that God had repented. And it didn't mean that God admitted he had made a mistake. It meant that God gave man the opportunity to exist and have dominion on this earth. He, a man like they're doing today, have abused God's resources to the point and their thoughts and minds and intents of their heart were always on evil things. You see, even the religious programming on TV today is steeped in evil because so many have compromised the truths in this book that the world looks at them and thinks, Lord, what in the world? Why do we need to go to church when this is the best that you're offering us? If you see... Somebody that's always telling you to live your better life. But tells you, doesn't tell you that because of your sin, if you don't repent, you're going to die and go to hell. He says, I don't want to preach stuff like that because I'm worried about running people away. They're going to have to answer to God for that mess. Because we've got to preach the whole, we've got to teach, we've got to live our lives according to the whole counsel of God. But Noah faced this world during his time, knew that God was going to destroy, his judgment was coming. We knew that he knew that in 120 years this, this thing was going to go down. Judgment was coming. God had, had changed his mind about the purpose for creation. And Noah preached, the people had all that time. An opportunity to come to know the Lord. Come to trust God. Through this godly man that stood and preached. Now Noah overcame the world. He's telling people it's going to rain. It had never rained before. The Bible says a mist had come up from there. It had never rained before. And he's telling them it's going to rain. That judgment of God is coming. And no doubt they laughed and scorned. Nobody believed him except him and his family. But you know Noah's testimony had to be right. He had to have overcome the world. Because as we see with the account of Lot. Not always did the words of your mouth. Don't match the life that you live. You can't expect anybody to listen to anything you got to say. <coughs> but Noah overcame the world. First of all through faithfulness. Noah had a task to do to build the ark. And to preach. Noah built the boat. He preached. And he'd done it for 120 years. Some people have a hard time doing the right thing for more than five minutes. But as we stay faithful to his task. And the world sees that you and I mean business. They see that we stay faithful in the midst of our world falling apart. You say, how can you stay faithful to God in the midst of your, your health is falling apart? Your life, the people, everything around you is going wrong. You have so many things going on in your life. Job said, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. We have got to be faithful. The Bible says, moreover, in stewards, it is required that a man or lady be found faithful. We can't expect this world... To deal with anything that we've got to say if we're in one day and out the next. We've got to be faithful. We've got to be faithful to the task. Noah was given a work to do. God told Noah, he said, I want you to build the ark out of a certain kind of wood. Certain set of dimensions. All of us that have built something at one time or another. 
New things had to be measured. They had to be done a certain way for it to turn out right. Noah was faithful to the task. He'd done it the way God said, do it. He'd done it the way God said, do it in the method, the means, out of the material and everything <coughs> was the way God told him to do it and he was faithful to it. When God gives us a work to do, we need to be faithful to it. If we want to reach this lost and dying world, we've got to be faithful to the task. We've got to stick with it. We've got to be in this thing. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 58 says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, not blown about with every wind of doctrine that comes along, we not only need to know what we believe about this book, we need to know why we believe it. And that's the duty of Sunday school teachers and preachers in our own personal Bible studies to surround ourselves with resources and stuff to help us understand the Word of God and to live it and stay faithful to it. Second thing, Noah overcame the world by being faithful. He also became by being obedient. I can read this book every day and I can be faithful to it. And I try to. I can pray every day and be faithful to it. Come to church every time the doors open and be faithful to it. And not be obedient. And it's been a waste of time. Noah overcame the world by being faithful and obedient. We have people that will sacrifice everything and lay everything aside that they could possibly ever lay aside. And do everything that they've ever done and do it. And they were not obedient in how they do it. The Bible says in 1 Samuel 15.22 that obedience is better than sacrifice. We can know what this book says. We can memorize what this book says. And that's great. Don't let me tell you that. Don't minimize that. I'm not pleased. Don't go out here and say that I did. I, I minimize the knowledge of the word of God. But if we can know it and read it and understand it and not be obedient to it, we're in trouble. We've got to be obedient to what this word says. Daniel, secondly, Daniel overcame the flesh. You know, so many times you hear people say, well, the devil really got on my back today and boy, that thing rode me all day. I venture to say most of the time when people say that, they've never had a battle with the devil. Because if we get past the world, you say you're a faithful person to the house of God, faithful to serving God, faithful to doing His work, and you're obedient to it. The enemy that trips most of us up, has tripped me up numerous times, is the flesh. No, Daniel overcame the flesh, first of all, by purpose. Remember Daniel chapter 1, they had taken the, he and the three Hebrew boys changed their names. And taken them into captivity. And he brought the, the best of the meat that the king had to offer, no doubt, that had been, when they come in and took out the nation of Israel and took them into captivity, they took the things out of their holy places. They took meat that had been offered to idols. It was telling these boys, hey, here, this is what you're going to eat. Here's your breakfast, here's your lunch, here's your dinner. Daniel said, I can't do that. He said, it might seem like nothing, but Daniel had a purpose in his heart. He had a purpose to do what God told him to do. And he said, I'll tell you what, you come back after a certain period of time, give us this to eat, beans to eat, or this lentils to eat, and you come back, and we'll see if we're not as healthy or even healthier than your people, then we'll take what you're offering us. I'm paraphrasing. We know that they came back. And Daniel and his three friends, the three Hebrew boys we read about in the fire in Daniel chapter 3, they were healthier, fatter, and in better health and in better shape than anything of the rest of the prisoners that had been offered a portion of the king's meat. Daniel had a purpose in his heart to do what is right. And he faced all kinds of opposition. The three Hebrew boys got out whole crowd of people, Nebuchadnezzar, had built this great big image and told everybody to bow down and worship it. This way you say, nobody tells me what I'm going to worship. But 
you'll find people that won't show up on Sunday to the house. Because some of you, you might not like me come back after this. Somebody might not. But you've got people that'll be too tired to come to the house of God on Sunday. But will miraculously be much better to go to their job on Monday morning. You've got people that are so too tired to come to church. A lot of times the reason is because of what they were out doing Saturday evening. We got to get serious about this thing. What I what the Lord preached to me last week. That I mean that's serious business. There's a cause. Babies being murdered. We've got sin running rampant. We've got people trying to tell us that the reason for the storms and the things that we're going through is because of global warming. You're right. The globe is warming up. Why? Because Isaiah tells us that hell enlarges itself every day. Because hell was never designed for, for you and I to go to. It was designed for the devil and the false prophets and the demons and all them that, fell, that rebelled against God in heaven. But because people choose to travel the wide and broad path that's leading them to destruction, hell has to enlarge itself all the time. But the judgment of God is a reason for the storms. The judgment of God is a reason for these things that are going on because we have tolerated sin in this country to the point where it is alarming. And well, it's, it's, it's not that bad. And people say, well, it's not that bad. It's because we've gotten used to the dark. You're right, it is. Daniel had a purpose in his heart and he believed in prayer. I get on Facebook sometimes and I post stuff and you see people say, appreciate prayers for so-and-so for a sickness or somebody's in the emergency room. And I take it very seriously. <clears throat> I take it very seriously because somebody's life from here to eternity or their soul could hang in the balance. But then you have people say prayers sent. Saying prayers. We've got enough people saying prayers today. We need some people that will grab the horns of the altar. And not let go until you've got something accomplished. Until God has reached down and stirred our soul. But we've got to have a purpose and we've got to pray. They told Daniel they didn't have nothing to accuse Daniel with. But they said he prays to his God that's against you, king. He prays to him three times a day. So they issued a decree, said praying to any other God other than the gods of the Babylonian gods. Don't do it. Said they'll throw you into a den of lions. You need to be careful. This is a little commercial right here. You need to be careful about the way you say things concerning the Bible. You hear people say, Daniel was cast into the lion's den. That was true. But a lion saying it was a lion's den could have meant there were no lions there. It was just a den where the lions stayed. He was cast into a den of lions. The terminology and the wording there is important because you could say it this way and people say, well, there must not have been no lions in that den. Let me tell you, there were lions in that den that God shut their mouth and stopped them from going. We've got a lion that's walking around seeking whom he may devour right now in this world. And he's duping people and to give it in to their flesh. To give it in to the world. And let me tell you, you face a battle, you say it seems impossible. But I tell you, there's the same God that shut the lion's mouth for Daniel when he was cast in the lion's den. It's the same God that can deliver you and I from the battles we face every day. As we seek to overcome this rotten state. Stinking flesh. Amen. You accept the Lord as your personal Savior. You accept the Lord as your personal Savior. That sin nature in you is not removed. The flesh you're in is not removed. What is placed in you is a new nature. The nature of God. The Spirit of God that takes up a boat in our lives. And the Bible speaks of in Romans chapter 6 and 7... And in, in Colossians as well, how that there's a constant battle. Paul said, the great apostle Paul, I believe maybe second is faithful and strong to the Lord Jesus himself. But the apostle Paul said, there are things that I want to do, but I cannot. 
Because of his flesh. And he said, there are things that I should do that I don't do because of the flesh. And how did Daniel overcome the flesh? He had a purpose in his heart and he wasn't afraid to take it to God. Some people think, well, I could, I could go to God. But I mean, you know, I, I can handle this. And that's where we run into trouble. It's pray about everything. If it matters, the songwriter wrote, if it matters to you, it matters to the master. If it's something that is coming against you or you're battling with, it's not too small or too minuscule or minute to take to the master. God specializes in things thought impossible and He can do what no other power can do. Noah overcame the world, that one enemy, through faithfulness and obedience. Daniel overcome the flesh through purpose and prayer. Job now. We know that Job dealt with the devil. We know that Job, the devil's accusing him and he said, you know, where have you been? He asked Satan, where have you been? You went to and fro in the earth. This, you say that's Old Testament. Well, New Testament testifies to this too. It is said that Job is the oldest book in the Bible, really. It's a poetic book, so it's placed with the other poetic books. But it, they chronicle the time back, so Job was before the law. So people try to tell me Job is under the law, and I just you got to got to be careful about how how some people would tell you about the Bible. But the Bible tells us that Satan going to and fro in the earth, he's still doing it. I quoted the scriptures a moment ago. Is walking about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. You think because you won a victory, you think because God has delivered you. Satan is not going to still come after you. Think again. Because as sure as the world. As you are delivered from a battle. As I am delivered from a battle. Satan is waiting for us. To relax and let down our guard. And what he's going to do is. He's going to try to devour us. With either the things of the world. The flesh or the devil. We've got to be sober and vigilant. What that means is keep your guard up. Job overcame an attack. From the devil himself. God said, have you considered my servant Job? Perfect, that means he's a spiritually mature, upright man. He fears me. He hates evil. And he said, take everything he has and he'll curse you. We read the end of Job chapter 1. He says, in all this, Job sin not nor charge God foolishly. Then Job, he said, man will give anything for his health or his life. He said, well, smite him. But don't take his life. See, when it will help us to realize one very important fact, and the very important fact that you and I need to realize is nothing that happens to you and I that God does not permit to happen or allow to happen to get us to a mindset that we need to trust Him even in the darkest moments. And there's nothing that Satan can do that God cannot defeat. Satan is a created being. One day he's going to be cast into the bottomless pit. One day the final words of the story is going to be told. And we go into eternity future. And he is bound and suffering in hell. But the problem is we've got loved ones, friends, neighbors, co-workers, family members. That will be there with him. If we don't do something. And deal with these enemies. And carry the message out there. Job overcame this battle through his faith. You say, but Job questioned, God, who doesn't? I mean, if we, I mean, Jesus hanging on the cross in his humanity cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? In his humanity, his father had turned his back on him. Why? Because sin had been laid on, on the Savior, your sin, my sin. The sins of the whole world have been laid on the Savior. And God cannot, will not look on sin today. That's why people think, well, my God's a God of love. They need to be reminded that His love is matchless and holy and cannot and will not look on or tolerate sin. The Bible tells us in heaven there will be nothing defiling or mean. While he questioned the purpose of his existence, he said, why was it? Why before I even started nursing, why was not my life snuffed out? Because of all the battles, he had lost everything. 
You say, that's a godly man. Why did this have to happen to Job after all he had been through? God wanted him to realize that even in your spiritual mountains, when you think you don't need God, that's when you need Him the most. Even on that mountaintop, when we're shouting the victory, we cannot afford to let go of the fact we would not be on that mountain. We would not have a shout to shout about were it not for the love of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and the price He paid. You say, but He questioned His existence. He did all that. <coughs> Even in the midst of his crying, even in the midst of his doubt, Job uttered two very important statements. And it shows his faith. Job 19 and verse 25, the Bible tells us, Job cried out, I know. I know. Not maybe, think, he said it with great surety. I know my Redeemer liveth. And later, four chapters later, in verse 20, chapter 23, in verse number 10, Job's beginning to see the purpose for his trials. He said, but he knows the way that I take, and when he has tried me, I shall come forth as gold. You come back at me and say, that's the Old Testament. All right, I'll take you to the New Testament. First Peter chapter 1, verse number 7, Think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though it were some strange thing. But the reason that you and I face the battles with the world, the flesh, and the devil that we deal with every day. It's to mold us into the image of His Son. So that when we go out and do the things we do out in public, that people see Him in us and not us. Acts chapter 4. Peter, James, and John were coming. The ruling class saw him and said, Hey, these are unlearned and ignorant men, but they knew one thing. They took knowledge that they had been with Jesus. Does this world, can this world tell by the smile on our face, the song in our heart? People see you and I, we've, we've faced all kinds of physical, emotional, spiritual battles all the time. And people say, How can you keep doing it? How can you find peace? Because you and I as children of God have that peace that passes all understanding. When this world doesn't see how we could be keeping it together, tell them we're not keeping it together. He is. Because this walk, this battle, this life is not about us. It's about Him. Are you facing a battle of the world attacking you today? Be faithful. Show this world the great things that God can do in and through you as you are obedient and faithful. Are you facing battles with the flesh? Doing and watching and saying things, participating in things that are inappropriate and wrong for Christian people to do? You know, people have said that, you know, people have, they have, Media has so promoted that sex is great. My Bible still tells me outside of marriage it's sin. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 13 that the bed, marriage is honorable and all and the bed undefiled. Whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. And yet the philosophy that it's okay. The promiscuity that Hollywood promotes that television promotes that the modern music promotes says it's okay but you and i know what this bible says that it's not let me spray spray this on down to tell you how the flesh will get you as well the bible says in matthew chapter 5 verse number 38 or 28 if a man looks on a woman to lust after in his heart He's already committed adultery with her. And ladies, that, that goes both ways. We face battles every day. And I went to Tennessee Temple and I'm done. Bible College. Part of Highland Park Ministry of Highland Park Baptist Church in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Our crest, our seal... Cross at Tennessee Temple University. 
Hebrews 4.12, down at the bottom, our motto was distinctively Christian. I'm telling you, we're called to be different. Message that I thought maybe God was going to lead us to is He bid me come. There were four times and there's many times in the Bible, the Bible says come. He told Noah to come into the ark. Isaiah says, come now, let us reason together. The Bible says that he says, come out from among them and be separated. We're commanded to be different from this world. The world is not going to want to listen to our marriage if, um, message if they do not see that there's something different about you and I. And that our message is carried in love. God dealt with me so different about this today because I'm so burdened on my heart about we think that we are actually in a face-to-face -face battle with the devil when we haven't got past the world or the flesh. That flesh is a powerful thing because it's going to war against your soul. Paul said, to do what is right and expedient for me to do, I cannot because I'm battling this flesh. But we need to realize that the battle's not mine. The battle's not yours. The battle is the Lord's. And as soon as we realize it and submit the battle to Him, the victories we'll see. But the more victories, the more battles. But what we need to do is we need to trust God. Have a purpose. Have a plan. Be obedient. Be faithful. And trust Him. Job said, though He slay me, Yet will I trust Him as we stand together. As we stand together, please, um, whatever sister wants to, to play, many facets of, of being here. I've got up here and come nigh to shout and getting excited. We've got something to be excited about. Then last week, the message always excites me. And I'm always nervous. You know, whenever you get up and do something for the Lord, the time that you are not nervous is the time you need to sit down. Because if there is not some uh, all, I guess that's the word I'm looking for, to be in awe of what you're singing about, I mean, you think of the price that he paid to make it way that you sung about. And think about the way that he made to allow us to be here. Now, I know this building is not the church, 